want us to talk about. So if we, if you have a question, we're not covering something, I didn't make it clear, raise your hand. So let's just make sure that we have communication because we're here to give you information. Great. Okay. And so, so what do I do here? Okay. okay. <laughs> Okay, you just got to mean it. So I want to start out by saying, unfortunately, I don't own any of these fabulously wealthy companies, uh, but I have talked for them and I have done studies that they supported. Okay, so let's see. Yes, our goal today is to talk about how people with Parkinson's disease have a high quality of life for as long as possible. Let's not forget that. The most important person in the room is each of you. That's why we're here. That's why we're doing all this. And thanks again to our sponsors. And how about a round of applause for all Julie is doing? Julie has been carrying a load for us all. I mean, she's got such energy, as you well know, that we couldn't do half of these things without Julie. So, okay, so let's get on with it. Um, I decided to make this a catchy title. So this is what I think the individual with Parkinson's and the families, you know, we do symposiums for you guys. We just did one in October, and there is a way you can look at it on YouTube now if you ever need to, if you didn't make it. So that's thanks to Julie. So the first thing you've got to do as an individual is realize you're the center of all the care. You are the prime person. So you have to accept the challenge, and we'll talk about that. When you first hear about you might have Parkinson's, the first reaction is, you're an idiot. I, I can't have Parkinson's. I don't think I, I, I don't want to have it. Michael J. Fox, in his book, you know, wrote that if he had an opportunity to be without Parkinson's disease, and being the kind of young brat that he was before, he's learned so much from this. He, he says that I would rather be the guy I am than with Parkinson's. And look at all that one individual has done for Parkinson's disease. So secondly, get smarter. We'll go through this step by step. That's what we're doing today. That's what we're doing when you come to the conferences and when you ask questions. Uh, your brain is like a muscle. It'll get flabby if you don't use it. So keep on learning as much as you can. The most important thing for happiness is an optimistic attitude. And you know people that go through hell and back and have cancer or more than one type of cancer. They're survivors. They're going to fight it to the best of their ability. And they are happier than a lot of people that have nothing to complain about. So be thankful for your blessings. If you count your blessings, you won't have any time to do anything else. The other thing is that we have all these studies and we have all these medications, but the only thing that really slows this illness down is exercise. So basically, you're like NBA basketball players or like athletes and we're just your coaches and cheerleaders. So in other words, if you take care of yourself, if you use your stubborn streak and say, this thing ain't going to take care, you know, you're not going to control me, I'm going to live the best life I can, then you're halfway there. So that means you've got to exercise regularly. I exercise twice a day, mainly so I can tell you guys you've got to exercise. <laughs> uh, that's why I look like Superman, right? <laughs> I don't know why I get such a laugh for <laughs> So you have to eat well. We're going to talk about this. Uh, there are quality measures that the American Academy of Neurology say we've got to pay attention to. We've got our own. We want to top that. We want to be the best that we can be for you guys. You've got to get a good night's sleep, and you can't enjoy the day if you're half asleep at the time. And volunteer to help in the cause. We need you because you are the center of this whole issue, and you can really make a big difference. Uh, be involved in studies. 
the study about, you know, can you walk and chew gum at the same time study, and then they start doing other things. It's a really good study. The people at UNO are, uh, look over the uh, kinds of information and ask the other part of the study. Okay, you also, what I say is don't just get mad and angry and upset and depressed. Get even. Get even with this illness and get healthier, despite it. You know, I may have told you at the symposium, a lady with 35 years of Parkinson's disease exercises like crazy, she's very active, and she might have an easier form of Parkinson's disease than you guys do. I'm not saying that you can all be like her, but when I saw her, I wasn't sure she had Parkinson's. But then I saw a little bit of a tremor once, and I saw a little bit of the dyskinesia when she was tapping her fingers, her head was doing this. And I said, well, if she's got Parkinson's, and she takes a pill every 16 pills a day of the cinnamon, and she figures it out, and um, is doing great. So we had to have her give a talk sometime. And then, again, use your stubborn streak. You know, look at it this way. Who's going to make me stop doing the best I can? All right, enough of that. Let's just go on here. And um, When you are trying to accept something, I apologize for the small uh, print here, but Elizabeth Kubler-Ross is the maven. I actually heard her talk once. And when you first get bad news, you deny it. Uh, then you get angry. Then you might get depressed. But then you sort of say, you know, if I can get over this, God, then I promise to be good, or whatever the bargaining you have to do. You've got to say, well, I will work out, <clears throat> but uh, I will still eat my favorite ice cream. I will watch, you know, you just make it. And then you finally get to acceptance. And once you get to acceptance, you can handle this. It's not easy, and if you ever do it, let me know how you did it. Okay, so the management of Parkinson's has got to be patient-centric. And there's a lot of teamwork. Look at all the people that we have here. We have physical therapists, nurses. We have everybody. Um, we have a support system, support groups. I was just in Phoenix. And I went to support groups that they're doing there at Barrow Institute and also at the community centers. And I'm impressed, but I think we can do better than they do. You are the autonomous athlete. Some of you guys probably play football, or some of you ladies, whatever athletic uh, activities you might have been in. And so we're the coaches, and we can tell you what you should do, but if you don't do it, uh, we ain't going to get anywhere. And there's a wide support system, and take advantage of it. Okay. Nobody sleep so far. <laughs> okay. The answer to this is yes. Exercise can slow the deterioration. So if you don't take anything away today, take away this. I believe the problem in Parkinson's disease is it makes you inactive. It's harder to do things. It takes longer, you have to do more effort, but if you do that, you're not going to deteriorate as much as people who don't. So that's actually been studied and proven in multiple studies. So that's why we say physical therapists should be part of this and you should do exercises. Yes, um, there they are, right? Yes. Right, and so the thing is, it's like, do you give a man a fish every day? Or isn't it better to have him learn how to fish? So the physical therapists give you a program that you do, and you go home, and who's going to stop you from doing it at home? You are, unless you use your stubborn streak and your backbone um, where your wishbone is. So anyway. I think most of the disability is due to inactivity, and it makes sense, uh, and there's proof now. Okay, why is that? You know, the, there's a deficiency in a substance called dopamine in your brain. Dopamine motivates us, makes us want to do stuff, and it moves us, it helps us move. 
Um, and too much of it makes us move a little bit too much, and that's dyskinesia when you take too much of a certain medicine. But that's the situation, and there's many causes. Um, but like Winston Churchill said, he actually was asked to give a talk like this. And actually the <coughs> audience was probably very happy because it's not going to take as long as this one. Rather than go through pages of notes, he just said, never, never, never give up. And he sat down. And he made his point. So and Napoleon said, you know, victory belongs to the guy that is still persisting at the end of the battle. So keep on keeping on. It takes a lot of teamwork, and I don't know if you can see yourself in this. It looks just like me and all of the people. <laughs> but it's hard work. Okay, uh, exercise, I, okay. And there's, John Wooden actually, um, my sister married into a family that knew John Wooden very well. And he said something really, really smart. Don't let what you can't do interfere with what you can do. Okay, things are slower. You're not going to be the athlete you once were. But look at all the things you can do. You know, there's a lot more things than you might be aware of. And just get with a group. Get with a buddy. Go for a walk. If you want to start exercising, don't you think you can get on an exercise bike and do one minute? Okay, that's what you do the first week. The second week, you can go to two minutes. You're not allowed to do two minutes in the first week. And then you build it up, and after a while, you're doing 30 minutes. 30 weeks, 30 minutes. So that's how you do it. You don't want to hurt yourself. And you have to do it under supervision. <coughs> so what can we do? And there's the, ten, the top 10 tips that I just sat down and figured out, well, there may be some other ones too, but... Uh, so, I said there are quality measures. The American Academy of Neurology says, if you want to be a center of excellence, you've got to reconfirm the diagnosis, make sure it's not something else. You've got to rule out psychiatric problems. People get hallucinations, they may get depressed. I tell people, you know, if you didn't like this, <clears throat> or let's say that's normal to not like it. If you did really enjoy all this trouble, we'd really worry about you. So we have to rule out things like memory loss, and we're going to go into just because you have memory loss doesn't mean it has to be from the Parkinson's. In other words, if we find, and we've found a lot of this, and we're going to talk about some of the research we're doing, that there's lots of other causes for forgetfulness. It could be that you're not eating the right kind of food. It could be that you're not getting enough sleep. It could be that you're distracted and not paying attention. There's lots of other things, and we've got to sort all that out. If you're not sleeping well, that's part of the problem. And autonomic problems are, you know, the nerves that go to our feet are controlled by the brain, and they control how much you sweat, they control the blood pressure when you stand up. And some people run into low blood pressure when they stand up. We've got to look at that and take care of it. If somebody has a sleep disturbance, I saw somebody just yesterday, now they're doing much better. We sent him to a specialist, found out he has sleep apnea. No wonder he's not so smart during the day. We have to make sure that people don't fall down. And when somebody does fall down, we can say, oh, it's the Parkinson's. Is the gait disturbance one of the big problems? Well, we're finding that there's a neuropathy sometimes. In other words, the nerves in your legs <coughs> are important because once you start losing your balance, it automatically corrects you. But if you only get the message when you're all already falling over, you're going to fall down. So we have to make sure that that is something that we count number of falls. Also, rehabilitation or physical therapy or speech therapy, swallowing problems, you need to see the specialist and figure out what's going on and correct it. We also have to make, out, make a lookout for safety rules. 
Uh, safety is a big issue, so you may need a grab bar in your bathroom, near the shower or the tub. And those things can be done. Uh, occupational therapy can help out with that. And then medications are great, but do you ever look at the side effects? It says, you know, if you, if you look at what a medicine is going to do for you, there's a line about this long, and then what it could do that you don't want is this long. And so once you start getting 10 or 20 medications, then we don't know what all the interactions are really doing to you. So sometimes it's not the right thing to say, oh, you didn't take this medicine. You're having trouble with your balance, well, take this. Or you need something to sleep, take this medicine. No, I think we've got to think better than that. And um, we're having a symposium a week from today where we're training the therapists and the nurses and the doctors and everybody that is helping you stay healthy. And then we have to review the medical and surgical options. Are you a candidate for one of the surgeries? You know, the other thing I just got to tell you is when I started doing these talks, about one third of the room was wiggling like this and moving around because they were taking too much medicine. And there was another half of the room or one third of the room shaking like a leaf. Look at you guys. You guys are in the sweet spot, most of you, right now. I know you're not feeling as good as you did when you were 20, but then if you had to go back and relive how good you were at 20, I don't know. <laughs> so anyway, we have our own. We do melanoma screening. One of the things I'm most proud of is we wrote an article on the cancer that people, the only cancer more likely in Parkinson's disease than other cancers, and that's skin cancer. The brain and the skin actually come from the same early tissue when we're fetuses. And you should get a screening and make sure that you don't have a skin cancer or something like that. Some of them are benign and they can just freeze them or take them off. Some of them are deadly. And we found in this study, we actually saved probably a couple dozen lives in this study. And we set it up so that you got a free dermatological exam and a free biopsy and a free interpretation. And we found so many early melanomas uh, that it was uh, very gratifying. Anyway, we also do nutrition and vitamin assessments. And we'll talk about the work we're doing with our dietitian, Jenna Paseca. Um, we're also doing exercise programs for how long? For the rest of your life. We want to prevent the complications, so we're trying to get to problems early when they're fixable. We also think you should use night lights, and you should have a path to the bathroom or wherever you want to go in the middle of the night, uh, and you should have a carbon monoxide detector in your house. You should have safety in your driving, uh, you know, if you're just going to go with the boys and have coffee at 5 o'clock in the morning and nobody else is on the road, I don't care. But we should, if you're having trouble, if there's an issue, I just tell people, why don't you prove to your family, use your stubborn streak, that you're really safe. And maybe you are. But if you're not, you need to know that. And maybe you can be like Trump. You have some woman or somebody in your family driving the places all the time. He probably doesn't have a license for all I know. I don't, I don't know. Anyway, so we also have to look at the other person in the room and say, are you getting burned out? Actually, we just had a poll by Dr. Torres, who's our fearless leader in movement disorders, because physicians get burned out and other caregivers get burned out. And we don't want that. I mean, you both need... You're in this together, and we need to take care of both of you. <clears throat> Education programs, I, I'm a big believer. So we have a 1,000 people at one of our patient symposiums a couple years ago. This last one, I think somewhere eight or 900 people. I think that's great. And I don't know that the Davis Finney Foundation has as big a turnout as we do. Anyway, patient empowerment, that's how we started this. You guys at the center. You're the athletes, we're your coaches, and if you take up the athlete role, you're, you're very coachable. And then we got tons of research trial opportunities and ways that you can help out. 
So I think we can outdo the rest of the country, and uh, let's keep it up. We see 6,000 people, uh, patient encounters a year in our group. So that's a ton. And we have great opportunities to help people. So speak up and ask questions, and we'll answer them. I want to just give you, uh, I don't know why we've got this thing. Um, just hit admit, okay, let's see. And just like this. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Sally uh, keeps us out of trouble here. So I saw this 85-year-old guy who has Parkinson's since 2012. He happened to be a neighbor of mine. He happened to be a doctor. Well, let's see. We'll talk about this. What's going on here? I feel dissed. <laughs> oh, uh, what, what happened is uh, I went to my eye doctor and he said, you know Doc so-and-so? I said, yeah, but I haven't seen him for a while. He hasn't come back. Well, he's not doing very well. <clears throat> so just think about that. And we'll talk about what we did later. So if you're not doing very well, oh, this is my... I used to go golfing and we used to, I don't have much time anymore, but we used to have uh, golfing tournaments. How much time is that? We're, we're still good. We have plenty of time for questions. Uh, next, okay. 4% lifetime risk for everybody in this country for Parkinson's disease. That's a lot of people. And we look at how many people now have Parkinson's disease in this country, and they haven't gotten up to the ripe old age where we tend to get Parkinson's yet. So it's 3% in women and 4% in men, and that includes some of the other things that kind of look like Parkinson's disease, like uh, supranuclear palsy or Lewy body dementia, those kind of things. And that's a lot of people. So. I wish I'd have picked an easier disease to take care of, but then again, you guys are such nice people, I'm glad to be working with you. It's got a lot of subtypes. You could get it from the environment, and you can get it from genes. And even in families where everybody has the same gene reason for it, there's a lot of variability in what they have. Some people have a lot of tremor, and some people don't. So it's a mix. And why is that? It's because we've got tons of genes. We've got tons of environmental exposures. Um, there's a kind where tremor is the big problem. There's a a, 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 the kind that there's not much tremor. Um, there's a long course. You, you really are starting to have it, but it takes years and years or decades before it's obvious. So we want to get to it as soon as you're starting to get it before it makes it hard to remove. So we're trying to find the disease-modifying therapy. We go to these meetings, and I think the future is going to be, if you have one subtype, we're going to find a medicine that will help that subtype. It's like if you have an infection, we can't just give you penicillin anymore. It doesn't take care of every kind of infection. It's not going to work for everything. I think it only works for like strep throat nowadays. So. so other things are needed for the other subtypes. And we're trying to treat everybody with just one thing. And it's not working out very well. So I think that's what it's going to take a while. So here's an example. If you look to the left here in the blue stuff, these are environmental risk factors. So if you're exposed to pesticides, this is Nebraska, right? It's farm country. We're all exposed to pesticides. The stuff that they put in ponds to get rid of the fish they don't want is a great producer of Parkinson's in experimental animals. So you have to watch out what's in your environment. I remember one lady who had Parkinson's disease, and her father had Parkinson's disease. Um, and they lived on a farm in Nebraska. And I said, well, maybe you've got one of the genetic forms of Parkinson's disease. So she sold her house and moved to the city. 
And the lady that bought her house got Parkinson's disease. So you can't tell just by taking family history because families are exposed to the same thing. Rural living, prior head injuries, agricultural occupation, if you drink from well waters. We did a study um, with one of our patients actually on what's in the well water. In the lower part here, if you smoke and drink and use NSAIDs, that's a kind of a, and drink too much alcohol, that lowers your risk. People say, what should I stop drinking and smoking? <laughs> it really has more to do with people with Parkinson's disease for many years are the good citizens. They don't take risks. They're not the evil can evils. They're not doing all this drug and alcohol abuse. Um, and that's because I think there's not as much dopamine for a long time. On the other side, these are genetic risk factors. These are all some of the genes, not all of them. There's more every day. And then some of them are protective. So we have to know a lot about you, and it's going to take a while, but stay tuned. Okay, uh, let's see. Can we go back one? Yeah, so the question is, when does Parkinson's start? Uh, so is it, some people think it starts in the GI tract. It's something that we eat in the environment and it slowly creeps up to the vagus nerve which controls the GI tract and gets up to the brainstem and it may take decades to do so. And there's good evidence that some of the cases are probably related to this. That there's some kind of infectious particle or a particle that gets into the brain cells and causes Parkinson's. So we don't know, but we do know, in the next slide please, Oh, this is my hypothesis. Why do you have trouble with what you have trouble with? Parkinson's disease attacks a part of the brain in the middle. All those uh, pink and purple things in the middle are parts of the brain that's where the base of ganglia are. Okay, and what happens is that's your automatic pilot. So when you're a year old, you don't have the cortex, the brown thing on the outside. You just have this basic central part of the brain. And you learn how to sit up. You learn how to roll over uh, from your back to your belly, to your belly, from your belly to your back, and stand up and walk and begin to talk before you have the decision-making part of the brain. So later on, this is your automatic pilot. Later on, you say, I, I want to walk. And you just go ahead and push a button on your automatic pilot and you can talk to somebody and give a lecture while you're walking. That's one of the reasons why the UNO people and we are working together on this walking and distraction kind of study <coughs> for Parkinson's disease. We want to learn more about that. So, do you remember the old kind of TV sets? The kind that you had to actually stand up and walk over and change the thing. <laughs> well, then they developed these clickers, right? And now, it's like when you're older, you can't... So now you just tell the clicker, which is your automatic pilot, what to do. And it changes channels. Okay, well, when this thing doesn't work, the automatic pilot doesn't work because the batteries are low, you can push all you want, but you're not going to change the channel. And guess what? There's no knob on these TVs anymore for changing channels. Okay, so that's kind of what we're up against. That's my hypothesis. That's why it's hard to roll over. That's why it's hard to get motivated. Because we can't access those <coughs> places in our brain like we used to. Okay. So this is a, a really good article. And we'll just try to make it simple here. Uh, on the left here, that's 20 years before you get signs of Parkinson's. Your GI tract, remember I was telling you a lot of people think this is where it begins? That slows down. Constipation is one of the early things. Then there's something called REM behavior disorder, which is dream sleep. That's about 10 years before. Then you lose your sense of smell excessive daytime sleepiness, and you may be 
maybe not depressed, but you sh look like it because you don't have expression. And people keep on asking you, are you depressed? And that gets depressing. <laughs> so, you know, it really is a self-fulfilling prophecy. And then you've got to then face the facts and go through that process that Kubla Ross talked about until you get to acceptance and say, okay, how am I going to fight this? Let's get my team together and let's do it. Then you start having slowness, rigidity, <coughs> tremor, pain, fatigue, and maybe some slowness in thinking as well. And then eventually you get maybe some forgetfulness, but I think it's inactivity and not using your brain in most cases. I'd like to think that because if you do use your brain and you keep on learning things, you're going to be better off. And then you get other fluctuations and dyskinesias, and then later on you get trouble swallowing, and then you can't walk, you can't... You have to find another way to start walking. You've got to look at a spot on the floor, or, or put painter's tape on the floor, and then you can walk. But you can't do it by using your clicker anymore. Okay, next. This is one of the... the studies that we did, so we got to look for melanoma. So go see a dermatologist every year and just make sure. And don't let me have a melanoma or something terrible. Next. Oh, these are all the guys we got. Okay, so back to this case, this guy that was my neighbor. Uh, next. And keep on going. Yeah, so, so what's the right thing to do? Well, the right thing to do is get him into our clinic again. And so I called him up and yelled at him and said, you know, the eye doctor, our common eye doctor, said, you're not doing so well because you've got to come in. We finally got him in. He's got a heart block and a pacemaker and let's see what else. He, oh, he was moving. And it, by the way, in case you don't know it, if you ever move, that's a big traumatic event. If you lose a spouse or if you retire or if some major change in your life is going on, you've got to just take it easy and not try to overdo it because it's going to take some getting used to. So next, so his, I mean his exam, his men, MMSE is, you ought to get a 30. Everybody ought to get like a 27 to a 30. And this smart guy is now a 21. He's not smelling anything. He doesn't speak very clearly. He can't feel things in his legs. No wonder he's having trouble walking. That's not part of Parkinson's. Trouble walking might be, but not losing sensation. In other words, <coughs> so then when we look at the motor scores, you know, when you see your doctor and they have you do all this stuff, it's the lower the better. So he was no-showing for two years, and then when we got him back, he was a lot worse. He had a higher score. So what did we do? We decided to check his nutrition levels. And let's look at those. <coughs> okay. So what, what these tests showed, let me just show you here, is it's a good thing we, we did. Back in 2013, he had a normal vitamin B12 level, but it was getting low, so we put him on IM shots, intramuscular shots, every month. And he was fine. But then when he, when he got, like he didn't want, he didn't want to get psychometric testing. We didn't, he, he didn't want to have anything done. He was finicky about what he was eating. And his wife, who was a nurse in her early life, just got fed up. And he was not cooperating and couldn't do anything with him. So also his blood picture looked like it was getting to be even worse. This should be lower than 100. And we found his B12 level was ridiculously low. And I said to him, yes, go ahead. Isn't the combativeness and belligerence part of the disease? It's also part of vitamin deficiency. Yes, it is. I mean, you get cranky because life is harder. That's a great question. By the way, ask questions throughout this. Because I, I don't want to do all of that. Uh, no, it's very true. You can be upset because you can't do things and it's frustrating, but get mad all you want, but just get even. It doesn't help to get frustrated. Just make the best of it. 
and make sure that you are eating right. So I said, you can't get a low vitamin B12 if you're getting shots. And he said, well, I quit the shots. I didn't think they were helping me because my numbers were okay. And I say, boy, you should have come in to see us. We could have fixed this. His vitamin B1, which is your memory vitamin. This is what we were taught in medical school only happens to alcoholics who don't eat anything. They just drink gin. There is, there is some caloric value in gin, but there's no vitamins. Actually, they tried once to put vitamins in booze to save such people, and I don't know, the alcohol in industry wouldn't let it happen. I guess they want to have dumb people. <laughs> so anyway, um, we tried to get him to do this, but actually he became more and more belligerent and uh, didn't do very well. So we had to get to people sooner than this. And so the question we have is, what, how many people with Parkinson's disease get vitamin deficiencies? And why should they? Well, let me tell you something. There's reasons, and this concerns me. And since I'm trying to find ways we can fix things, why do Parkinson's patients not eat very well? Well, for one thing, you like the aroma of a steak. I'm sorry, you don't have a good sense of smell. So you go for the sweet, the salty, the sour, the bitter stuff that your tongue can appreciate. You eat junk food. You remember in the news media in this last year, there was some young kid who was only going to, I don't know, McDonald's or someplace, and he went blind because he wasn't getting enough vitamins. And they couldn't fix that. So you, have, you are what you eat. You've got to be careful and make sure if you're starting to eat the wrong kind of food, see a dietitian and make sure you're taking vitamins if you're low. Other things is that you are not choosing the right foods. You have trouble swallowing. Some of the low vitamins make it so you don't feel like eating. And you may be kind of difficult or ornery because this isn't a lot of fun, but you have to make sure it's not from something else. So when somebody with Parkinson's comes in, are we doing okay time-wise? Okay. And has trouble walking, I'm going to say, okay, what else could this be? Because if you're starting to get a neuropathy, we can fix that. It might be diabetes. We can control that. It might be a low vitamin. Let's find out. So it could be that your teeth aren't working very well. You have poor dentition. Maybe you get vomiting or loss of appetite from the levodopa. That's a common side effect. You eat slower, and you can't get as much in. You have a slow GI transit time. Remember, you got the constipation. So you're full earlier. There's try not enough room in there. Try balancing spinach salad on a fork. <laughs> there you go. So, so, yeah, the question is, you know, how easy is it to balance a steak salad on a fork? You know, it's not the best thing, but you can pour it in the Vitamix and drink it. You know, I, I don't recommend it. You lose the enjoyment of it, but that's part of the problem. And, you know, we've encouraged patients to tell your own stories. And he's an example of one. He's written a book. And uh, another one of our patients wrote a book about his Parkinson's called Shaken, Not Stirred. <laughs> and, you know, you have a lot to teach. We learn about what it's like to live with Parkinson's from you guys. You can read all the textbooks you want. And there are people that are just now getting the diagnosis. And if you've got Parkinson's for 30 years and you're taking care of yourself, they need to know how you did it. And so you guys, I think we ought to write a book, have all you guys write a chapter about what's the most important lesson you ever had. We'll have Julie coordinate all that for us. <laughs> <laughs> There's also trouble. Um, if we don't find something early, prevention, by the way, needs correcting it every time. And so we as providers have got to think about it. You know, when somebody says, now they're getting demented, we say, oh, some people with Parkinson's get demented. Yeah, but if your vitamin B1 level or B12 level is really rock bottom. So we're doing this study with Harvard now. Jenna Paseca is running this. Um, so we've got 176 patients as of this week in this study. 
These are people that are new to Parkinson's disease. And we're also finding, like I was away for a week in Phoenix, and I came back because I'm OCD, obsessive compulsive. Friday afternoon, I wanted to sign all my charts. I found three people in that week with dementia because of low vitamin B1. So we got it fixed just like that. One of the patients that we fixed was seeing butterflies everywhere. And a few days later, they all went away. And when I tested her memory, it was perfect when she came back. Because we got on it right away. We don't think about it. We're too busy, so we got to hardwire it. There's a lack of organization, so we got to use a protocol. How do we treat this? Uh, there's complications, so we got to prevent things. And the patients are non-compliant. So we got to hound them and call them and say, you got to come in, make sure, we got to check, make sure your blood levels are back to normal. So we can do it. We've got data collected in, this is the Harvard Food Questionnaire. It's about two or three pages. And all you got to do is tell what kind of foods you like to eat these days. And a guy I went to medical school with at Harvard that publishes almost more papers than anybody else. Uh, I guess he doesn't see many patients like I do. At any rate, uh, this is a world-class study that we're doing. And so far, this is the population that we have. The age at onset tends to be 64. So this is this cohort of people that we're studying. A lot of them have weight loss. And weight loss is a cardinal problem. We have to make sure, why are you not eating? So I'm just going to show you a couple of things here, if I can point. All right. Vitamin B1, which is a memory vitamin, 7% of our patients in this group are deficient. Vitamin B12, you remember that doctor friend, 40% are deficient. So we have got to check for these vitamins. You go anywhere and hardly anybody taking care of Parkinson's patients looks at this stuff. Because we were taught it's in alcoholics. And then vitamin D is also very important. Vitamin D gives you bone health. And 20-some percent of people are deficient in this group. So what does that mean? That you get weak bones. You get osteoporosis. You should be taking calcium. You should be taking enough vitamin D. So when you fall down, you get a hip fracture. And you shouldn't have because your bones were too weak. So we're focusing on how to prevent this kind of stuff. And we're... You know, submitting this at the American Academy of Neurology, this got accepted. We're going to spread the word as soon as we can. And then um, we're going to skip this one. It's the same thing. So vitamin B1 is in fortified breakfast cereals, enriched rice, noodles. It's in the handout. And you can look on the cereal box, for Pete's sake, and they'll tell you what's in there. And you say, okay, you know, I say a central silver every day, and then get these things checked because you may not be able to absorb it. And if it's low, fix it. You know, it should be something that we do automatically, and hopefully we're going to get the rest of the world to do this kind of stuff too. Vitamin D, we get 80% of it from the sunshine. Good luck in winter in Nebraska <laughs> getting a suntan. Right? So there's a lot of people, actually 90% of the people in India, for Pete's sake, as kids, are deficient in vitamin D. And they have a lot of rickets, which we eliminated a long time ago, because all dairy products now in this country are fortified up the wazoo with vitamin D. I'm going to stop here, and just so um, more to come. Uh, and thank you for your attention. I want to have questions.